contact information. John X from U.S. East Coast is not a reference. John Xavier with an actual phone number and an email address is a real reference. Make sure the seller has lots of them. And you want to make sure there are positive reviews on forums, reputable third-party platforms like Google Reviews, Yelp, Trustpilot, and eBay. This is important to establish that the seller is a real person and or entity that has a track record and satisfied past customers. Okay. Ariza L. asks, new topic, I recently saw your video about your preference of the Patek Nautilus over the Aquanaut. I have the luck to own a Nautilus 5711, but I would like your recommendations for Aquanaut alternatives, and I mean a daily sport rubber-mounted watch. Okay, brief recap. The Aquanaut 5167A retails for $18,940, but we're seeing years-long waits at Patek dealers and markups from $25,000 to $29,000 if you buy one with instant gratification pre-owned. That opens some doors in terms of pricing your alternatives. So $32,000 buys a new FP Jorn Octasport in titanium with strap, but you can find the 2012 to 2014 aluminum models as well as the 2014 to present titanium models for between $22,000 and $26,000 pre-owned. So there's a little bit of depreciation and you get your choice of the original Octasports or the current models. So at 42 millimeters with a date power reserve indicator, five-day advertised power reserve that's actually more like seven days, as well as uh, swimmable construction and full loom. This is a legitimate all-day, everyday alternative that you can pick up on a whim if you've got the money to buy an Aquanaut new or pre-owned. I should also mention the rare 99-piece Indy 500 edition often sells for as little as $21,000 despite the scarcity. So that's definitely something you should consider. That's part of the original aluminum series, a 2012 model of your watch. F.P. Jorn says all versions of this watch can be taken in the water. So though you see three ATM often published, this is a swimmable watch per Jorn. Just have it water tested first and it glows like a torch in the dark. You also want to consider, since we're talking steel watches on straps, the Jorns were base metals, aluminum and titanium, but we're going straight steel right now. A Gen 2 Vacheron Constantin Overseas Chronograph. This might be the best pre-owned chronograph you can buy in the high horology sports watch class. Underrated now that the Gen 3s are on the market, keep in mind you can Pay less for the simple auto, but why not go for the chronograph? It costs less than the Aquanaut bought new. Depreciation is on your side, so expect to pay 17000 to about 18000 for a watch that retailed for twenty grand back in 2015. The watch still looks like twenty grand, especially in the 2012 to 2015 blue lacquer dial version that you see right here. That would be my personal choice. And it has the potential to dress up on a leather strap or a bracelet more than the visually rigid Aquanaut, which looks wrong on anything but its standard geosphere cut composite strap. Water resistance and anti-magnetism are outstanding, whereas the Jorn is barely swimmable and the Aquanaut is robustly swimmable. This one surpasses even the Aquanaut. 150 meters water resistant with real screw downs and 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetism. This is a tough watch. And remember, this is a better play on a smaller wrist than any standard sized Aquanaut. Now we have a question that seems to recur. The internet has something like a downright Shakespearean fixation on the number three, especially collections numbered in threes. And the question you guys keep asking me is, what three Rolex collection would you buy, Tim? Okay. I realize that I have idiosyncratic tastes, and the three-watch collection I would buy probably isn't the one you would buy. So I'm going to break this down three different ways. Three by three. Three watches, the Tim Masso collection. Three watches, the Rolex purist's choice. And three watches, the Rolex bandwagoner's preference. Let us start with me, because it is all about me. I'm the star. Okay, so here it goes. The Tim Masso collection. I'm going to stick with 21st century watches. Please, forgive my ego. So, I could go all the way back into the 20th century and pull out so many references that I would love to own, especially the old Oyster Quartz Day Date. But I'm going to stick to recent watches because that's what most folks relate to here on the internet watch shows these days. For me, Milgauss Z Blue.
this is as good as it gets in my mind. If I had to put together a one-watch Rolex collection, this would be it. From the moment I saw it, Love at First Sight, a revision of the hottest Rolex of 2007, the GV star, GV for Glas Ver, green crystal, had dimmed by 2014, and this was the result at Basel World. What everyone remembers from that year was probably going to be the white gold Pepsi, but this is the watch that struck me. I would take it in a heartbeat, and that would be my number one. My number two would be the Rolex Daytona Beach. Technically, this is the 116519, and there were three different versions. There were, well, there were actually four. There was one that was pink, there was one that was yellow, and there was one that was blue, all mother of pearl. This one is the chrysoprase dial. So, were they marketed to women? Yes. Did they ship with a short strap as a result? Yes. Is this my first choice? What do you guys think? Leopard aside, this was the weirdest Rolex of the 2000s by far. And yes, the green Christopher is dial right there with matching paperwork is super quirky. I even love the, li the lizard skinned box that came with it. Uh, a sodalite dial might run this one close in my mind, but I've been team green forever and I am unlikely to change sides. I'm not scoring an own goal. I'm going with the green. Now, Cellini prints. There were a couple. From 2005 to about 2014, this was probably the weirdest ongoing offering from Rolex. And I have to say, the white gold Cartier tank killer that never was would be my choice for number three. I love lost causes and beautiful losers, and this one speaks to me on both levels. The timepiece is also about the movement, and I love movements. It comes with Rolex's first production display back over a gorgeous caliber 7040. Each caliber 7040 was actually finished to match the dial. So you see that sunburst variant of the movement on the sunburst dial version. 70 hour power reserve manual winding Rolex chronometer. Not something you see too often in the modern era. That was a truly special watch and if you can wear a reverso grand tie, you can wear this thing. I like both. Okay, now Admittedly, I'm a quirky fellow, and I would buy quirky Rolex watches. So let's go with the Rolex Purists collection. This is the guy who loves Rolex, who never wears a Rolex to be seen, who buys the Rolex that interests him most, but buys with Rolex's history and heritage in mind, as opposed to someone like myself, who buys with idiosyncratic personal preference in mind. So let's start with the one to own, the no-date Submariner. Today, that means the 114060, and this is where the Rolex purist starts. It's the real sub. I know it, you know it, he knows it. And I also have no problem with the Rolex pop culture pander involved here. That's a big part of Rolex's appeal. Remember, none of us need a tool watch that costs over $1,000. So as long as we're buying luxuries, let's buy some luxuries that have some ancillary meaning to us, eh? Even the purist is not immune to a little bit of fandom. Datejust, but Datejust Turnograph. Give me the 116264 stainless steel and white gold. It is arguably the most important modern Rolex. It's the volume seller, it's the money maker. When the subs are waitlisted, when the Daytonas are waitlisted, and the GMTs are waitlisted, this is the watch that is paying the bills in Geneva. I should also mention, launched in 1945 to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Rolex, it's also older than the sub and the GMT and the Daytona. A cardinal reference, get the one with the rotating bezel because yes, also preceding the Submariner, this was the first rotating Rolex bezel sports watch in series production. What more can I say about it? Well, the Datejust Turnograph is also discontinued, and you're bringing in a little bit of USAF cool. It is actually a watch descended from a piece that was issued by the U.S. military to its pilots, making it one of the few cases where a Rolex was standard issue for U.S. servicemen. Datejust Turnograph, need I explain any more? Finally, the GMT Master II, but... The 16760, whether you call it the Sophia Loren, the first of the twos, or the fat lady, a term I think we're probably going to have to retire in the current political paradigm. This is the GMT master to own if you're not going to own the original 6542, whose nickname, sadly, we have already retired on this show for reasons of uh, political cognizance. Now, the timepiece right here is the one you want, because right now, despite the fact that it was the first of the Coke bezels, the first of the GMT Master 2s, the first of the true dual times, and it had a short production run. Nevertheless, you can still pick one of these up in good condition with accessories for under 10 grand, meaning 
You can pick this up for a lot less than a second-hand current-gen steel GMT. You'll pay $8,950 for a Batman. You'll pay $9,250 for the new steel Pepsi on a Jubilee. And for that price, you could have this, a genuinely historically important milestone watch in the GMT Master Collection. If you owned the original GMT Master and this, that would be a two-watch anthology of the GMT's greatest hits. Okay, the Rolex Bandwagoner. You may know him, you may be him, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being this guy. Just acknowledge that you're not alone. There will be many others like you. That might mean fraternity online and new friends. So, the Submariner Hulk is where he starts his collection. Yes, a sub with a date, but the it watch of the moment from Rolex. Even in the era of a steel Pepsi, that is still the watch everyone's after. Green gold dial, or at least that's how Rolex advertised when it launched back in 2010. I love this piece, but you're going to wait longer for this than any no-date sub, and that's a fact. A watch with a lot of hype behind it. What's trendier than a green sub? Eh, probably nothing. And for once, I'm not only speaking for myself from my own green fetish perspective. Ceramic Steel Daytona. Make it the white dial because of the two, that's the more mainstream. You won't be disappointed, but prepare to pay dearly pre-owned or wait possibly years on the dealer's wait list. Make friends with a dealer. Make friends soon. Send them Christmas cards. Or... And finally, either of the current GMT fixations, and there are two big ones hitherto mentioned on this program. I have to mention, either offers a great way to spend some serious coin on Chrono 24 or quality time with your Rolex dealer. Make friends, send a holiday card. Now, speaking of quality time, Batman and Pepsi sounds like a capital plan for rotting your teeth and your brain during hot Labor Day weekend fun. And I approve. With that, we scurry off to the Batcave and viewer wrist chats. All right, viewer wrist chats tonight. Gregory L. gets us underway on land and sea with his Brigade Marine 5817 and his Jaguar. On the road again, Alan D. ups the ante with his Watchbox sourced Grand Seiko Snowflake and white Audi S5. Doran G. keeps us rolling with his Omega Planet Ocean and an Audi of his own. And Tudor A completes our epic road trip with a VW and Breitling Aerospace combination from the Romanian freeway. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, best feature of the week. Shameless self-promotion. I have to admit, this one is all about our crew here at Watchbox Studios on our Watchbox Reviews channel. Link in the description in the box below. But while tonight's show was, by necessity, fun and short, the fun continues on Watchbox Reviews, my other channel. Our Versus series of watch face-offs is ongoing, with two more by popular demand U.S. for both of these watches. This week, we've staged the Vacheron Constantin Overseas Chronograph Generation 3 Blue Dial against the AP Royal Oak Chronograph in a showdown of late model steel sports chronographs from some of the top names in the business. Can the traditional power in the segment, the Royal Oak, hold its ground against the onrushing assault of one of the most polyvalent and extensively re-engineered stars in the new era of haute de gamme sports? Well, find out on Watchbox Reviews. I have to remind you that once you've chosen your winner, we have a way for you to continue the fun with our new Versus playlists. That's right. We are now up to 13 of these things, and you can binge watch Watchbox style on Watchbox Reviews with our Versus playlist. Viewer wrist shots were back in business. We opened with watches and cars, and what could possibly top an Audi S series? Well, Troy R goes next level with a Watchbox source, Bauman Mercier, Capeland Chronograph, and Japan's Mighty Shinkansen. I hope you put that tachymeter to good use on the board. Bullet train. Christopher G shares his longer one that I actually consulted with him to pick among many options. He had an email exchange, and this was the result. Christopher, thank you for trusting me. David B dines in good company with his Royal Oak at Boston's Top of the Hub, a skyscape and wristscape all in one. And Shannon S from Germany takes us home with his FP Journe Santigraf. Red gold and blue jeans is a sharp combination. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Comment below 
as this is a recorded show. I will be interacting all Monday long. And remember, subscribe if you haven't already. Click the link to go to our new Versus feature. Thank you, guys. Stay online with me when the broadcast ends. Follow Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I'm Tim. This is the Watchbox. Happy Labor Day, and thanks for logging on. Thank you.